Grigorovich, Energy Resilient Communities Officer for the Yarra Rangers Council, Paul Cassidy, experienced research assistant in the sustainable housing and energy fields, and Chris Weir, president of the Bendigo Sustainability Group, spoke to our Thrive community about methods of creating sustainable energy and energy resilient communities. Their talks were part of November's SDG 7 theme on providing affordable and clean energy. After their presentations, our presenters kindly took questions from the audience. So at first, I'm going to ask with a couple of general questions that I have here. Um, what does the rapid growth in renewable energy mean for the whole energy system? This is one for any one of the three presenters to answer. Um, <laughs> it's a very broad question. Um, so in terms of Victoria, uh, our, our state government has set about a, 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 a quite a big investment over a period of time to encourage renewables in both solar, wind, and they're now seriously looking and engaging with offshore wind to enable and uh, roll out of batteries um, and um, so that they can help reduce the amount of coal that Victoria is using for its current electricity system. So um, the Victorian government has certainly set about um, to undertake that. And they've got a major initiative. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's something like 70% by uh, 2030. Um, so the government is really um, doing that. But at the same time, we found that the government's really keen to ensure um, that the communities are on board. So that's why they've funded the community power hubs to enable the community to understand and be involved in part of that re the renewable energy projects and that's pathways. Fantastic. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, I've got another one here. Of, oh, Ooh, sorry. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to mention something on a practical, um, one of the, the biggest aspects of um, the way the power grid was set up originally was that you had a centralized power source, the electricity went one way to your clients. Now, one of the biggest issues has been, um, and that this is also partly led to the development of things like batteries and all, is the fact that you've got power going multiple ways to, in a system that wasn't designed for that. Um, so it's part of the issues that I wouldn't say that this, the long lasting solutions are being created. It's still, um, it, it is a very difficult situation to overcome because the system, you can't pull the whole system down and start again. You're actually utilising a system that wasn't designed to be having things going multiple ways. So um, that's yeah, just something that I think is really important for, for people to know. Yep, absolutely. Thank you very much. There's very good insight there. I have one more general question for the whole panel. How does digitalization enable flexibility and resilience in the energy system and what new risks might it pose? Good question. Um, it's a discussion we're having at council at the moment. We have a, a utilities officer who um, manages all of our online platforms and contracts when it comes to renewable energy on our council buildings. Um, so the digitization of that monitoring and everything is really exciting, but it also comes with risks um, like we've seen with all of the, the large scale hacking and loss of information from people. Um, yeah, exciting, but also has its risks. Um, but it makes it, it makes it much easier when we've got platforms that allow us to see how our soul is doing on our buildings and we don't need to send somebody out to check on it. So that's super exciting. Yeah. That's a great answer. Does anyone else have any more input on that one? No, my example is with the, um, all, all most inverters these days um, have a Wi-Fi connection with them. Um, and so that's why, um, the majority of inverters uh, these days are connected and so people can read. So that's why I say we've been running monitoring. We also provide that for the clients that they can have a look and see what their, um, what their um, consumption and what their input from solar is. So um, that it's a kind of a basic element of, of the renewable energy space. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I've got a question here for Amy. Um, 
Could you elaborate on your biochar system, please? It comes from the Ooh, I thought we would get a question about biochar um, and our uh, sustainability officer who is on the line tonight um, is our guru about biochar and I'm not so I apologize I can't tell you a lot um, but it's a facility that's gone in and out at our Lister Field Waste Transfer Station um, in an attempt to use um, waste biomass um, to produce heat and um, biochar that can be then used in gardens and on different applications which is really exciting um, but I'm sure we've got some more information on our web page which I can link for people um, and if we'd like to share some more information we can answer any specific questions afterwards if that um, attendee would like to send them through that's also fine yeah absolutely no that's great thank you um, I've got one here for Paul Paul, um, does or can the wood vinegar activate the biochar? Good question. Um, the, there has been quite a bit of research. I think the simplest thing is that um, biochar increases the effectiveness of almost anything that it's mixed with. So uh, the two of them put together uh, will be more effective than either one separate that's yeah. um i'm not an expert on on these areas this is uh the i my main involvement has been with the development of a technology that will be utilized um and hopefully i'll be able to report on this it'll be up and running sort of sometime in the middle of next year um yeah. that will be utilizing um, biomass and waste and things like that to actually produce these byproducts um but there's certainly and as I mentioned, the other thing is, is that there are many different forms of wood vinegar and many different forms of biochar. So one of the things that I've discovered in some discussions today is there are council areas that are looking at, okay, what is the biomass that we have? And what other byproducts that could come out of that? How can we best use this for farmers in our area? What do they need? So it's becoming quite sophisticated, uh, which is very exciting. Um, so there is no one set answer to that. It will depend on a lot yeah. of different things. Yeah, no problem. Would there be, this is a question from me to you, would there be collaboration with any of the tertiary institutions and in offering that up as a master's research or something like that? Um, uh, as I, I mentioned, my, my involvement's with the Latrobe Valley um, mm -hmm. and I know that um, that authority is actually having some they have involvement with, uh, I'm trying to think of the university down there um, and um, people doing, looking at doing honours and things like that. So yep. I know that they, they, there's an understanding that you have to have, you have to develop your education system to be able to train people to be involved in these areas. It's, it's absolutely yep. crucial. Um, absolutely. My hope is that that can be developed on a more than a regional basis, but certainly from what I've seen, the Latrobe Valley's um, really doing its best to, to be a leader in that sphere. Um, as I'm sure the Yarra Valley is as well. Uh, it's very yeah. exciting times. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm loving that all of these practical um, applications are in fact happening in rural areas. I feel like um, the Metro still has to catch up a fair bit there. Absolutely. That's really Can I just exciting. mention something to Amy, if I may, just in terms, you mentioned a number of different types of um, energy systems that, that are uh, valid for um, particularly for post emergencies. One of the things that we, the discussions were held with regards to these biomass to energy units that I think she mentioned something like about 25,000 trees fell down in the yep. storm recently. Yep. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, these things are gonna be happening again and again. Um, the potential to actually use a bioenergy, a mobile system um, if you've got the chippers and whatever, you can take a tree, you can pull it apart and it can be used then on site to be able to be pulling apart all that material, producing byproducts, mm -hmm. a whole range of different things. Um, I, I certainly would be interested in any discussions if, if Yarra Valley was interested in looking further into that. 
um, particularly yeah. with the twenty five thousand trees. That they've got. <laughs> it's it was it's definitely um, the the amount of biomass that came down following those storm events is, has definitely shaped our thinking with the biochar facility because um, we had multiple staging areas to cope with all of the fallen trees and um, trying to uh, put them to various uses. Uh, but the thought of a mobile biochar facility is very interesting. So um, yeah, happy to discuss. Definitely, okay. Paul. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Great. I have a question for Chris here from a participant. What was described could be categorized as a distributed community asset. Can he comment briefly on what sort of insurance model solution has been applied to that asset for when a storm comes through and tears your asset apart? Um, or off the roof in terms of a solar panel? Yes, yeah, so, so um, basically each uh, uh, building, uh, we talk to the owner and we get them to make it part of their uh, building insurance. So okay. um, that's, it's just like, you know, if they blew the windows out, they'd have to replace the window. So um, we do encourage them to put it on as one of their um, you know, when you when you do a building insurance to list it as one of their um, major assets on the building. Um, and we found in most cases, we've, we, we found um, the, the, like a surcharge for the solar um, when we started in the early days was reasonably expensive. But now they've, they've just found um, over the years um, that that price has come down. I don't know how that works with all all the areas that have been really impacted, um, you know, in terms of, you know, having to build new houses or where the trees have gone down. I, I just don't know in terms of the insurance, what's, what, what's that going to do? How's that going to impact? But basically it's up to the individual owner of the facility that we put the solar on. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I actually have another question for you as well, Chris. Um, the question is, recently people have been saying that returns in terms of money per unit of solar produced are going down for solar panel owners. Does this affect the communitarian dimension of solar energy generation? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what they took. I, I think um, what they're asking is, so what we found is that the cost of panels have now started to go up. Um, for quite a period there, they were reasonably inexpensive, but now there's issues with supply chain and overseas delivery. So certainly the cost of the panels have gone up, um, but we haven't found uh, that it's affected our um, fundraising, um, especially with the community. We're totally committed to trying to do community housing um, and work with the government in that because that's one of their big expenses. So for low-income housing, if we can put solar on the roof, um, uh, that can help reduce their, their uh, outgoing. So, um, you know, that's quite an, quite an important element. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yes, absolutely. And that also makes sense why it's reducing the, um, the output money of the solar panels of the panels themselves are in fact the cost that's increasing. Um, I have another general question for all three panellists. How could we bring in a younger generation into the learning and awareness of renewable energy and resilient energy? How far do you think they will integrate this? And I'm assuming this, how far do you think they will integrate this? I'm wondering the learning itself about this technology. That's how I'm interpreting this question. How far? Will um, society I'm, integrate that learning? I'm, um, I'm happy to go first as a, as a recent yep. graduate. Um, I think there's huge potential for young people to be involved in um, like the transition towards renewable energy and away from fossil fuels. Um, I think there's a lot of effort that needs to be put into developing apprenticeships and university courses and TAFE courses and things like that that upskill young people um, to have the skills that we need to implement different things. Um, but I think there's also a huge role when it comes to community engagement um, and young people having a unique perspective to guide the different infrastructure and um, projects that they'll end up living with um, throughout their life. So, yeah, I think there's huge potential um, and people like ourselves really need to facilitate their involvement as best as possible. Yeah. 
So we've also encouraged, um, and we work uh, closely with La Trobe University Bendigo. Um, they've got a sustainability course, and um, and we work with uh, uh, the students themselves and encourage them to come along and be part of one of, you know, I talked about the Ninja team. We encourage them to come along and get a hands-on experience with being with one of the Ninja teams because, time, you know, their time, they're caught up with a whole lot of different stuff. Um, and we've just found if they're involved in a project, which sometimes can take three to six months. So, um, but it's a real practical hands-on experience. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, um, my, sorry, I, if I may, just my, my experience yeah. has with, with the project uh, that I'm involved with, it, it's because it's a bioenergy unit that's producing byproducts. Um, one of the things that um, some of the discussions we've held has been, for example, if the unit is producing wood vinegar and biochar, which are all useful to a farming community. Um, and a farming community is able to understand, and particularly young farmers are much more likely to take this up, um, that it is able to actually uh, impact on the destruction of their land, the degradation of their land, allowing a whole range of other things, reducing costs. Um, because that's coming from an energy system that can also be used um, and is impacting their local, their local, their local town, etc. Um, there's a potential if, if these projects are actually um, presented in the right way of creating a, a lot of interest because it impacts young people as they're growing up, and and particularly ones in rural in rural towns where people are doing things very hard. Yep, fantastic. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any more input on this one? No, nope. I'm going to move on to another question for Amy. How is the communitarian dimension in sustainability achievable by overcoming the selfish dimension of individuals and the profitable dimension of business? Oh, <laughs> quite the question. Can you repeat that again, Manuela? How is the humanity? Uh, communitarian apologies mm -hmm. I've never heard that word before tonight um, dimension in sustainability achievable by overcoming the selfish dimension of individuals and the profitable dimension of businesses yeah good good question um I think probably two points from my perspective um I don't think we can view sustainability initiatives um as like approaching it from a behavior change at an individual or like a, a cohort or a community level. I think depending on the project and the scale of what you're trying to change, you've got different audiences and your approach will depend on who you're trying to target. Some people are solely interested in the individual benefits and will act only on things that benefit them then. Um, other people are interested in that social lens of doing things because it's um, working with like-minded people. And then other people are interested in that more collective level, community action, microgrids, um, et cetera, scale of projects. Um, so I think that there's a, there's a focus in um, community engagement and behavior change programs that need to kind of focus on that. And then secondly, I think there's huge potential for a transition away from fossil fuels to also appeal to that um, business-minded group of individuals who are just concerned about costs. Um, I think they're complementary to one another. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts. Chris, Paul, do you have any other thoughts? To yeah, add? Um, so we found, uh, like a lot of the organisations, um, corporate, private, um, sustainability climate change they're very much aware of that now um so 10 years ago it was an uphill battle but now and especially of late when we look at bushfires and the floods um organizations are very much aware that they can help uh in some way to facilitate sustainability um especially in the renewable energy so we found that um they're extremely helpful um and 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 individuals but as you so rightly point out, there's a lot. There's some people who are just not interested in, in that space and helping and contributing, um, both financially or, or in um, commitment. Um, but we're finding that's changing very much so because um, you know they've, people have realised that we're going to have to all work together in in what's going to be a very very much a changing environment. Yeah. Um 
my my feeling is actually nature is probably going to be the biggest um, instrument in this process. I mean, you're looking at the, the floods that are there now and you're looking in New South Wales and Queensland and Victoria. When that's all gone, the impact on the electricity infrastructure in all three states is going to be absolutely mind-boggling. Um, there will have to be so much that needs to be replaced. And one of the things that I think that will happen because this is happening with increasing frequency, it used to be something that happened every 20, 20 years, it's now happening every 10 or every five, that to, to actually replace thousands of kilometres of wires, et cetera, become something that's untenable for the, for the electricity infrastructure companies that it becomes much more effective to actually create stuff that is decentralized. You just don't put wires there and you put something that sets up in a town, near a town. Um, and so I, I yeah, I, I think our, our climate will actually be one of the biggest instruments. What hopefully will happen is that people will add voice to that to assist the, those companies actually begin to change their structure. Um, but I think those patterns are gonna continue. They're not gonna, they're not going to stop. Yeah, and decentralized um, supply chains or decentralized supply will also minimize that uh, disruption. A you know, if one supply chain is disrupted, that not everyone is all of a sudden sitting in the dark. So there are def the um, immense benefits of the microgrids as well. I've got another question here Absolutely. for Paul. Um, with reference to your first overview slide, can biomass be processed without generating any syn gas? Can be processed. Um, you can. I, I think Amy mentioned that they have a unit that basically produces biochar. Um, the the majority of the units that that I've had. Um, connection with, um, as I mentioned, basically produce either just syngas or syngas and biochar no, or syngas and biochar wood and wood vinegar. Um, but certainly there are a lot of facilities um, and one of the companies that I have worked with, it makes a number of units that, that just basically you, even you just throw in the logs and you burn them and out comes the biochar at the, at the end of it. So it's a, it's a very practical process. Uh, and, and it really depends on what the client, what people want, what, what people need at the other end. Do you need soil supplements? Do you need, yeah. So um, the beauty is, is that there's a number of different technologies now that can provide a range of different options for people to look at. Does that make, is that a, an answer? Yep, that is an answer, I think. <laughs> um, a question for Paul. Oh, another one. Um, are you aware of any research done on what happens when wood vinegar as herbicide or as growth stimulant runs off farmland um, in various combinations and concentrations into freshwater creeks, rivers, and flows onto saltwater coastal ecologies? Um, again, I'm, I don't profess to be an expert. All, all I understand is that um, if you put um, these her a herbicide on on weeds, it'll kill the weeds. Um, but in terms of does it uh, remain, does it um, pollute? My understanding is that its impact will be significantly uh, less than that of um, chemical fertilizers, chemical herbicides, um, because they tend to stay around for a really long period of time and get into different things. They change the nature of the chemical structure and the biological structure of a whole range of different things. Um, that's not the case as far as I understand. But again, I think it probably would, it involves research. And it's, this is still probably in a, a I, I know there is a com company in Australia that makes, um, uh, I guess what you call organic herbicides or, um, um, uh, but they're, it's certainly not the majority at the moment. Um, so I, I would be looking into those companies if, if it's a question that you really have a lot of interest in and asking questions directly to them. It's not, unfortunately, it's not something I can think Yeah. So just well, want to have My, my a... understanding of the um, 
is the, the, the biochar units I've seen. And interesting enough, there's one up at Pyramid Hill here that's next to the tip, and they're using uh, a lot of dry wood, but also almond husks and things like that from, our, um, uh, from some of our agriculture. And uh, some of that liquid they're capturing in a tank. So it's not just like an open tap into the field. Yes. Um, it's captured into a tank and, and then oh, absolutely. on Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's, it's um, used and, and it can be used for a whole range of different things. My, my, the question, I, I can't categorically say no that it doesn't produce any side effect. Um, all I've seen is that, um, and there's, um, I think one of the links that I provided with regards to uh, Wood Vinegar Australia, um, it's an organisation that um, produced a whole lot of uh, information um, that I've drawn upon um, concerning uh, the uses for wood vinegar. Um, and I think I did one on, on, on biochar as well, that um, their uses uh, are very wide ranging. Um, my understanding is, is that they're non-toxic, but um, and and it has has a lot to do with the, the feedstock, you know. So um, yep. Meredith Cheese, which is just outside uh, um, Ballarat, um, they've got a biochar unit that they're using to create heat um, mm. as part of their manufacturing process. Um, mm. And um, so they they use a dry chip, which comes from some of the forests. So the the wood chipping from the forests where they cut the timber. Um, so if, they, if it's a dry wood, then there won't be as much liquid, I would have thought. Um, mm. So it, it, it depends on the feedstock. Yeah, I th that's probably a really crucial point. And I think I mentioned it before that the, the actual attributes of both the biochar and the wood vinegar will change quite significantly depending on what biomass you're actually putting in there. Um, so who knows, there may, there may be some biomass inputs that, that may produce a more toxic output that, that, that may not be as, as useful as different forms. Um, you, yeah. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't know, quite know where to actually that, that's fine. find an answer to it. No, so we do in fact have um, some chemical engineers and some other experts to do with contaminants as part of our team, our research team, and they are able to expand on your answers some more and we can update that in our uh, on our website um, at the completion of this session um, so I have another question actually I'm going to use one of the general questions now so as another one I'm interested in as well. How will new business models adapt to the future energy system and who will pay for the transition? Good question. <laughs> it's it's multi-layered. It's it's yeah. um, you know, um, if you want big electricity, then then that's a government, and then you've got um, your generators who have to switch. So um, uh, Australia is amazing in the sense of we have the highest take up of rooftop solar in the world. Um, I think we'll catch up per capita in terms of solar farms. The wind one is an interesting one. Um, you basically, your best areas, uh, um, certainly in Victoria, um, they tend to be on sort of big flat plains or mountain areas. So there is a bit of community resistance against them, um, but in the majority, um, um, we're starting to see um, communities that participate and get um, get some uh, a dollar for their for a wind farm being on their um, site, um, all the way down to an individual who might have solar on the roof and a battery and you know possibly electric car. So the emphasis is on the individual, and it depends on the government how much of a grant they're hoping to able to facilitate. So the objective of trying to meet the 2050, um, you know, targets, um, both on federal and on state level, they're trying and going as hard as they can to encourage individuals and businesses to take up 
Um, so yes, it is it is a change. Um, but in terms of things like electric car, most most cars people turn them over in five to seven years, especially if they're a commercial. So they're, they're not going to jump out tomorrow. They may do it in two or three years. Yep. Okay. Look, at this point, I'm going to start wrapping up the um, discussion panel. Um, I want to let everyone know that any more questions that we have, we will take them on offline and we will um, advise Chris, Paul and Amy of those questions and you have an opportunity to answer those and we will then um, publish those answers on our website later on. Um, again, I want to thank you all. They were all fantastic presentations, very informative, and case studies always um, help us being able to visualise how that theory, that model that we're striving for can, in fact, work in the real world. So, again, thank you very much for all your contributions tonight.